now. <laughs> what can be appropriately delivered thus to an absent audience, unpredictably various in its future accidental composition, I can only sketchily envision. This is not an ordinary invitation to read poems. It is known by my hosts, I believe, that I renounced poetry when I had come into the prime of my capabilities as a poet. I do not give, as it is said, readings of my poems in the usual salon style of address to a choice sympathetic audience. Where I participate in any way in the presentation of poems of mine, I insist on the presentation of some report of my findings in poetry, an, insurmount an insurmountable obstacle to the use of words for the full achievement of the very objective that is the reason of the peculiarity of the utterance forms functionally inseparable from poetry and the basis of its identity as a historically revered institution, regarded as an indispensable component of the humanizing content of society. This condition that I impose, along with the ideas that prompt it, is generally viewed, where met with by professional practitioners of poetry and special reader and critic sections of the literary population, as of a range of the unpleasant, particular impressions produced by it ranging from inconvenient erraticness to aggression. Where those who have who having interest in my poems become newly aware in these later days of my changed attitude to poetry, resentment or at least discomfiture can arise. A while ago an invitation to address a special audience of devotees of poetry was voided when acquaintance was made with the later attitude and the fact that it would not be suppressed by me in my material of address. Now, the actual case of my later thinking on poetry is that it opens to practicing lovers of poetry, a practice that ought to enlarge their hearts with new joyful hope, if their love of poetry is of a humanly generous expanse, not of the self-generous guarded scope of personalistic ambition. What I propose is no denial to poets of the beautiful role of proving the mind-renewing, soul-saving efficacies of language. It is a liberation from service to the poetic ideal of an exact perfection of truth of expression in fixed verbal patterns that celebrate the ideal in illustrative evocations of it to service to general human proficiency in the linguistic capabilities so that the norm of word use may become by common dedication an exact perfection of truth of expression in which personal and general truth have a practical unity. The labor of devotion to such an objective would not conduce to a lowering of the status of the poet by making poets of everyone. It would simply conduce to an elevation of all human beings to their proper status as natural articulators of the reality of their being and of the entirety of the realities of being from which their being issues. I can cite an experience of my private life to show my understanding of how my thought on poetry and language can be provocative of annoyance, even to an angry degree. My criticism of poetry I hold to be a fair omen, to have promised in it of a kind of replacement of it that would do no dishonor to its attempts at fulfillment of the happy potentialities attending the possession of language, as no disrespect was directed at my poems in my renouncing poetry. There is an inveterate suspicion lodged in human character of criticism that, be it gentle, suggests as desirable the replacement of something to which there has been protracted addition. A rush of assault counters the criticism as a threat to the very validity of the existence of those involved in the critical suggestion. Such a rush as a counter-assault is voiced at me sometimes by a person who comes at call to help me in physical tasks beyond my strength. At his feel of the first breath of criti critical suggestion, before it becomes comprehensibly explicit, he raises up cries of pain. Miss Jackson, you are stomping on me. Poets who encounter my eventual thinking on poetry and language with open ears ought not to feel stomped on. I shall offer in termination of the first part of this address in ignorant society as to what sense of good or otherwise it may have for its unimaginable hearers. A figure of comparison drawn from St. Augustine's passion. That is to me dramatically suggestive of the kind of difference I feel there to be between commitment to a career of poet and the alternative commitment to a career of labor 
for the release of the generality of human beings to a full activity and enjoyment of the delivery and reception of words formed for utterance with pure care for their work as implements of truth, exactitude, eloquences, perfections of express purpose of happy community of being. St. Augustine re renounced the grave responsibilities of prof a professorship of rhetoric, having decided <coughs> gently to withdraw, not tumultuously to tear, the service of my tongue from the march of lip labor. He wanted to transpose heart and tongue, both from the literary skirmishings of academic law to a conspectus of the nature of truth and its laws, unbounded by prescriptions of utterance forms and the very forms of reason to which the concerns of truth were subsidiary, if not altogether disregardable. I mean no extravagant claim of grandeur in this comparison for the alternative to dedication to poetry I have described. Where the objective of a precisely expressive and self-expressive humanity, governed by knowledge and love of the universally shared possibilities of the benevolent, wise and beautiful intercourse of which words allow, is not conceivable as the naturally proper normal of human articulateness, I would let this objective be its own answer to the accusation of grandiosity. The problem of the failure of poetry, the failure of poems, to succeed in being of utter seriousness linguistically, and if poems are not thus successful, they fail to meet their chosen standards of excellence, has been never more ceremonious, ne never more than ceremonious, ceremonially resolved in the literary attribution to poetry of a particular kind of seriousness as a peculiar property of poetry. Poetry, that is, by its conventional nature, endued with vestments of mystery that intensify the implications of seriousness uh, without increasing the interior substance of it. Much of the serious intent in poetic endeavor has to be left hidden or lapsed in inexpression because of the failure of the conventions designed for special poetic success of expression to be linguistically adequate. I consider myself to have gone to the limit of the possible in the effort to achieve in poetic expression a compatibility between the verbally versatile and the linguistically adequate, which may be otherwise described as the conventionally stipulated unconventionality of poetic forms of word combination <coughs> in the law of language of the necessary truth of the linguistic good. I shall in some minutes read some passages from a late written poem of mine of the title when love becomes words. It exemplifies the difficulty in poetry, reducible but never transcendable, of achieving expression that avails itself of the maximum in linguistic potency of seriousness of expression. Every other category of the serious in linguistic statement, as the religious, the philosophical, the political, the historical, and there has been modern increase in such categories, has its open reach of seriousness of statement. But the poetic reach is categorically a clipped one, and modern experimentation in diffusing the conventional prescriptions of poetic peculiarity <coughs> has broken up the weight of implication of in an interior residence in poetry of a peculiar serious order of seriousness. You cannot say it all in poetry. Where you cannot say it all, you are stinted irremediably in how seriously you can speak. There is that something of lightness in the poetic presentation of themes, be they of the utmost of inspiring seriousness. The verbal versatility that bejewels the process of poems making by requisition produces an almost continuous close sailing to the wind of wordplay. The use of metaphor, its tempting relief to the mind so often at a loss for the immediate right provision for the fixed pattern poetic word course becomes a chronic virtue for the fixed pattern uh, uh, current virtue of permitted caprice of statement. The theme of my poem, When Love Becomes Words, is the vision, not alien to the po poetic persuasion, of a power in words, informed with the breath of life and used with all one's sincerity of faith in life, to translate life for one into the purified shapes of thought. The course of such translation I endeavour to narrate in the poem in the terms of real experience, I choose the all-live matter of love 
as the test subject of the vision of the realizability of such translation, love in its most difficult aspect, wherein women and men engage with each other in a crucial trial of reconciliation of cosmic differences. I place the entire matière of the narrative on the plane of poetic statement. The form of the statement is personal, but the personal form is a dramatization of what is conceived of as a form of general experience. Instinct of poetic limitations upon seriousness in an imparting of wholly serious vision shows everywhere in the poem, in a controlled exercise with an almost diffident delicacy. Instinct of these limitations goes in company with instinct of the poetry cultivated limitation in degree of seriousness with which the reader will take what is presented because it is a poem. <coughs> I avoid in this poem as in many another. Surrender to the tragedy of an instinctive premonition of the inevitable stalemate towards which poet poetic statement is headed, stoppage of the movement of its sense into a reality of livable utterance with the good humour of an unaffectable certainty that in language itself there in here no absolute limitations. Now to read from the poem. The passages are not consecutive, nor do I begin at the beginning. Sometimes we shall declare falsely, young in an earlier story sense, impossible at the reduced hour of words. But however we linger against exactness, enlarging the page by so much error from the necessities of chance to survive, we cannot long mistake ourselves being quit now of those gestures which made the world a tale elastic of no held resemblance to our purpose. For we have meant and mean but one consensus of experience, notwithstanding the difference in our names, and that we have seemed to be born each to a changing plot and loss of feeling, though our earth it is at home in such a timeward place. We cannot now but match our words with a united nod of recognition, we had not hitherto heard ourselves speak for the garrulous vigour and furor of the two lively loves as they clattered like too many letters from our hasty lips. Let us not think in being so protested to the later language and condition that we have ceased to love, we have ceased only to become and are. Our love being now a span of mine, whose bridge, not the droll body is, striding the waters of disunion with sulky grin and groaning valour, we can make love miraculous as joining thought with thought and the next, which is done not by crossing over, but by knowing the words for what we mean. We forbear to move, it seeming to us now, more like ourselves, to keep the written watch and let the reach of love surround us with the warm accusation of being poets. Then, to read a poem, also of later writing, which very strongly illustrates, I think, that good humour of which I have spoken, is the quality of an unaffectable certainty, that in language there in here no absolute limitations. But while the sense of peace in the confidence of the resources of language may seem not very strange, associated with a poem of the title, When Love Becomes Words, will it not seem a conceit of poetic metaphysics, where the subject is a state of the exterior world, the political world of 1937, merging fast with the world at large of the time, a people, impossible not to see as one of lowering horizons, as I at least saw it from my private watchtower. The poem was written in London. I was very busy evaluating in various forms of work <clears throat> what resolutions of understanding were possible to human thought as practical resolutions of all that was still indeterminate in human beings forming of their existence into its distinct meaning as human existence, forming themselves into distinct human, into distinct being as human beings. Perhaps I have said enough to put light upon the kind of relation I believe to hold between our words and our minds, by which we draw ourselves up into the heavenly condition of self-responsiveness. The title of this poem is March 1937.
This is the poem of a month within a year, within a world, within an atmosphere grown black from that we see not. We do not see. The atmosphere is dense with devils. The world is empty from the expulsion of these. The year, such spectacles the blind wear. <coughs> the month, as eyes in night are holes, so is the mouth an abstract organ. And vision, now a thing of thinking, the thirsty eyes from damp brain drinking. I shall tell a story. Once, since here I lay the curse of fiction, which is the curse of thought's constriction to once and not again, within a month, within a year, within a world, within an atmosphere incredible, because sight loathes it, will not see it. We are like shuddering angels, locked within a desert heaven, within an earth made populous by sin's expulsion. Once, oh, believe it not that this we live is so. Already is the month's recoil a long ago. The story with the pained eye passes into time's museum of darkness, where what has been to staring horror protests its innocence. It is not, nor ever was it. Sight and heart make strange mistakes of seeing and believing. And so the gasping month within the tangled year, within the tearing world, within the torn atmosphere, stops breathing, seeing, dying. Another month upon the shelf appears. The days like book enamoured fingers prepare to reach. Sight and the heart, their new mistakes, beseech. Here ends the story. The poem takes the story away. We have left nor a month, nor its least cruel day, nor the envelope without the envelope, without the envelope within. This is the poem. Are we so naked then of life, stripped to the death? Is this the promised core of us? Come closer, let us not shudder so, shiver. We are not ill, nor dead, nor uncovered in the last, in the last shame of ordeal. There is something so good in this that, despite worry, hope, and no letter, I scarcely dare let myself wish for better. In this poem, I leave the human case open. The words of judgment are within the case, will issue from within it. I add a closing portion, which I dedicate to Dr. Laura V. Monti, to whose desire and invitation I am here responding. She would have liked that I talk of my life, for the interest of this especially, for those who, by the work course of their lives, have not much opportunity for knowing of me by direct access to my work. She had in mind mainly my work as a poet. My life as a poet terminated about 35 years ago. I grew into being a poet from a natural centeredness of my consciousness to how others, my presumable likes, I their presumable like, spoke themselves. This as the key to what they were. In how they spoke themselves, I knew by my likeness to them and my difference from them in this likeness that there was much amiss with how they spoke, and therefore a one piece with this, much amiss with how they were, what they were doing with themselves, in and with how they spoke. To find the speaking way by which I and my likes could be with responsible distinctness what we were in truth as beings of our kind, this prompted me into poet being. But this motive was not confined within the literary mould of poet identity. The forces of motivation busied themselves in the entire field of preoccupation with what human beings were, both as what they made of themselves in how they spoke themselves and what they should be by the evidences of language, of other ways of speaking themselves than as they spoke, which they did according to various possible seeming choices of decision as to what they were, or according to seeming inability to do otherwise, although they seem otherwise to be. Thus, by the extendedness of the forces of my motivation, I put upon the office of poet a very great burden of discovery as to the speaking and the being of human beings, as one and the same all crucial problem. For those who may be interested in my connections with poets, I shall just here record that I have found poets generally a weak link in the chain 
of human labor for the fulfillment of the spiritual necessities of human beings. Despite the apparent strength of the attachment to the linguistic good that the tradition of poetry suggests. Of what stuff that link should be made has been my continual concern and was not otherwise than that when I functioned as a poet. For it was part of that general concern that I endeavored to prove if the metal of poetry was not of the essential nature of that stuff, wanting but some purifying from alloys. Suppose finally I read a little passage from my book, The Telling, and then a little passage from the book on language that I worked on very long with my husband and completed after he died in 1968. I take the latter from a supplementary essay of the book that is all of my writing. But is there a real poetic vision? I have spoken of poetry as incapable of answering fully to our needs and our powers of knowing and telling the human experience to the full. But I think that there has been a reality of special vision in some poets. There are some whose minds are instinct with an assurance of there being a knowable and tellable all, even while they obey the poetic compulsion, the ordinance of poetry itself, to abbreviate truth for beauty's sake, to present visible parts of an invisible whole as if they were presenting the whole. Spiritual perception in such can overleap the artistic limitations of poetry in an awareness of more to know and tell than can be poetically conceived and articulated. I view this awareness as not common among poets, as an occasional manifestation in the past, and now not confidently presumable anywhere. Uh, to which I'd like to add, uh, uh, perhaps with one or two or so exceptions. <clears throat> then, to read from that essay, which is of the title, The Matter of Metaphor. There is much to say on metaphor as a device of expression resorted to in poetic composition. Metaphor is indeed immediately suggestive of poetry, has no immediate implication of serviceability in ordinary word use. It is counted as a device normal to prose composition, its employment there being more casual than in poetry. <coughs> Where it rises from the casual, it is rated as poetic in style and can be stylistic erraticism when it is laboredly employed. Poetic composition can also be stylistically erratic, foolishly or grossly poetic when the device, is a me device of metaphor is employed beyond poetic limits in linguistic discretion. Metaphor, of course, is not born of compositional needs. The expressional, the compositional needs, the expression proclivities of poetry. It is embedded in the natural conditions of language, and the use of it in the ordinary or regular course of word use is governed by linguistic discretion, even as in poetry. The laws of discretion as to metaphor there being of a certain privileged looseness as compared with constraints they impose in ordinary linguistic practice. There is, it should be evident, both a natural character in metaphor as a component of linguistic expression and a character of irregularity, linguistic unnormalness, in any form of employment of it. Yet it is mistaken to think of it as a special department of expression, an extra area of linguistic expression, a something <coughs> additive in the resources of expression. <coughs> Metaphor has relation to a vocabularistic short to, to vocabularistic shortages in language. There are not words for everything. There is no finality of vocabularistic sufficiency in a language. The measure of a language sufficiency is in what the words of which it is constituted allow of in the expressible by the general scope of meaning that they encompass in their greatly diversified combi combinability. The use of metaphor affects no expansion of the meaning potentialities of a language. 
The device of metaphor works in instances of narrowness, of expressibility, real or presumed, or created by some circumstances adventitious to the actual word content of the language. In principle, it is an accommodation of the resources of the language to particular difficulties imposed by their limitations. Figures of speech should not be regarded as enlarging upon the given expressible, but rather as, in principle, coping with particular vocabularistic deficiencies within a general linguistic sufficiency. A figurative likeness posited between one thing and another is bound to be defective as an, as an identification of a certain character of the subject of the likening. The character could be identified with perfect descriptive accuracy in time, with fairly sound vocabularistic acquaintance with the language. Vocabularistic shortages are capable of being compensated for by the putting of the available verbal resources to well-considered use. The figure of speech is an immediate act of substitution of one meaning possessed by an existent word for another meaning for the expression of which there is no word or is no word or no word comes easily to mind, or the meaning of a composite verbal expression for what would more closely fit the need of the occasion if all the specific verbal components of an exact expression of the actual subject of expression were linguistically available at no inconvenient delay of assemblage. I have been asked to read a little from my poems, a little more, and I have also been asked to comment on the immediate contemporary pressures of interest in the literary and poetic work of women. I regard the general contemporary concentration on women as having an identity that needs liberation and new definition as the product of a mistaken, superficial, intellectualistic dismissing of the actual problem of comprehension of what the identity of women is in relation to that of men in cosmic terms. For I do not think that, that, that this matter of the peculiar identity of women as human beings can be comprehended in the terms in which women are now attempting to define their identity which are merely the terms of masculine, social, political, psychological modernism. The subject is too large <coughs> to be even coherently broached in brief. I shall read two poems of mine that treat of the problem of the identity of women. The first is divestment of beauty. She, she, and she, and she. Which of these is not lovely? In her long robe of glamour now, and her beauty, like a ribbon tied the wisdom of her head round. To call these women is homage of the eye. Such sights to greet as natural, such beings to proclaim companion to expectance. But were they now who take this gaudy franchise from the accolade of stilted vision, their lady swad swaddlings to unwrap and shed the timorous scales of nakedness. It were a loathsome spectacle, you think? Eventual entrails of deity, worshipful eye offending? It were the sign, man, to pluck the loathsome eye, for swear the imbecile theology of loveliness. Be no more doctor in antiquities, chimeras of the future in archaic days embalmed, and grow to later youth, felling the patriarchal Leah, that it lie reft of all obscenities, while she and she, 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 disclose the recondite familiar to your candor. And then the poem, Auspice of Jewels. They have connived at those jeweled fascinations that to our hands and arms and ears and heads and necks and feet and all the winding stalk extended the new spell of the face. They have endowed the whole of us with such a solemn gleaming as in the dark of flesh love but the face at first did have. 
we are studded with wide brilliance as the world with towns and cities. The travelling look builds capitals where the evasive eye may rest safe from the too immediate enlargement. Obscure and bright these forms which, as the women of their lingering thought, in slow translucence we have worn, and the silent given glitter locks us in a not false unplainness. Have we ourselves been sure? <coughs> what steady countenance to turn them? Until now, when this passionate neglect of theirs and our twi twinkling reluctance are like the reader and the book whose fingers and whose pages have confided, but whose sight and sense meet in a chilly time of strangeness. And it is once more early, anxious, and so late, it is intolerably the same not speaking coruscation that both we and they made endless, dream long, lest be cruel to so much love, the closer shine of waking, and what be said sound colder than the ghastly loveless. Until now, when to go jeweled, we must despoil the drowsy masquerade where gloom of silk and gold and glossy dazed adornments kept safe from flagrant realness the forgeries of ourselves we were. When to be alive as love feigned us, we must steal death and its warm splendors from the women of their size we were. For we are now otherwise luminous. The light which was spent in jewels has performed upon the face a gradual <coughs> eclipse of recognition. We have passed from plaintive visibility into total rareness, and from this reunion of ourselves and them under the snuff lantern of time comes an astonished flash like truth, or the unseen, unheard entrance of someone whom eyes and ears in their dotage have forgotten for dead or lost and hurrying toward distracted glory, gemmed lady pageants, bells on their hearts, by restless knights attended, whose maudlin plumes and pummels urge the adventure past return. Thank you very much.